Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Amy, and I am one of the pastors here at First Christian. But we like to say that we are all ministers because we all have a ministry. That is, we have our creativity, our gifts, our lives to offer God in service to others in love. You all are the brave, the few, the spring forwarders who remember to set their clocks last night. Uh, if you have uh, an, a smartphone, it will do it for you. But um, I didn't trust it. I knew it was I supposed know. to, but <laughs> I'm paranoid every year. And the one, the most important clock I forgot to set was the one on my coffee machine, because I I make it at night and then it turns on and and the smell of fresh brewed coffee fills the air. That didn't happen this morning, um, so I'm dragging a little. But uh, we like to say that we live into faithfulness. We act as if um, spring is here. We act as if love is on its way, and it becomes true. And so we are coming alive in Christ, and we are coming awake <laughs> today together. Uh, I want to point out these beautiful flowers. These are in honor of Rick and Laura Ricks and their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. Those are beautiful. Wow. I love it. Yeah, that's great. It's really good to, to celebrate love. Let us take a moment to become present to this time, this space, to breathe deeply in the Spirit of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to anoint us, and to hold up a little bit of light together and say thank you to God. Let us stand and worship God. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. You've been trying to feel the same old holes inside. There's a better life. Yeah, there's a better life. You've got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom, a safe in. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain break. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. Yeah, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way made. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain break. Lift these words with me, church. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Please be 
be seated. We sure are glad y'all are here this morning. Even if we are all an, an hour less excited. Exactly one hour less. But if you're just waking up at home, realizing, uh-oh, that's okay, you can tune in. Well, I guess if you're hearing me say this, you're already tuned in. But that's okay. Come to Sunday school. Yeah, come to Sunday school. Get out of the PJs. All right. I want to, to draw your attention to the names that have been added to our prayer list. We've got Earl Skiff and Piper Noakes. Piper Noakes. We also want to have prayers of healing for David Timmons and Pat Ortmeyer, who both had surgery this week. And they went well. They just still need uh, prayers of healing. I'm sure, I'm sure they've still got a long ways to go. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father God, please help us get back to the heart of worship this morning. As we know, it's all truly about you. It is far too easy to get caught up placing worldly distractions on a pedestal. Belongings, appearances, wealth, careers, and many others. Help us to remove these distractions and to idolize you, the one true almighty God who is worthy of our praise. It's stated in John 4 that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Lord, help us worship in spirit and truth this morning. We lift up our pastors as they bring us a message you've laid on their hearts. And be with all those who are healing, sick, or hurting. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen. Shouldn't drive. 
My music's an hour behind, too. <laughs> I know y'all know this one. Praise team. Praise God. All right, friends. Good to see you all this morning. You know, sometimes at 9 o'clock I sit down facing that way and I get up at 9.17 or whatever, and there's a few more of you in here. It's a, it's a joy. It's a blessing. Uh, we are continuing in our sermon series uh, that we're calling From the Ashes. Okay, this is week three of our From the Ashes study. We know, we know where we're headed, okay? We know that Easter will come. We know that we will rise from the ashes in due time. But uh, we got to be willing to, to get in the fire a little bit first. We talked about that in week one. Uh, week two, Pastor Amy talked about the importance of repentance, right? This idea of, of metanoia, of, of a turning of the mind and the heart uh, away from the ways of the world toward the ways of God. 
And today, today I want to I want to do uh, something a little bit different. This is this is what I'm going to call the the caveat sermon in the series. Okay, those of you that know me know I love the phrase yes and. Okay, so this is going to be our our yes and sermon in the From the Ashes series. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna look at at a passage of scripture today that is maybe a little bit less familiar to you, uh, a little bit unusual, okay? It's going to include some unfamiliar imagery, and it's going to contain a term that's relevant to us right now, uh, but that maybe, maybe is, is unfamiliar to, to you, maybe uh, one you haven't heard, okay? And the term is feeding on ashes, feeding on ashes, okay? I'm going to read this morning from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44. It's a little bit longer passage. If you want to follow along in your Bible or on the screen, that's great. If you want to just close your eyes and and sort of uh, picture this as God speaks to you, then you're welcome to do that as well. Isaiah chapter 44, we'll read verses 9 through 20, and watch for the phrase, feeding on ashes, okay? All who make idols are nothing, And the things they delight in do not profit, their witnesses neither see nor know. And so they will be put to shame. Who would fashion a a god or cast an image that can do no good? Look, all its devotees shall be put to shame. The artisans too are merely human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand up. They shall be terrified. They shall all be put to shame. The ironsmith fashions it and works it over the coal, shaping it with hammers and forging it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line, marks it out with a stylus, fashions it with planes, and marks it with a compass. He makes it in human form, with human beauty, to be set up in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or chooses a home tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it can be used as fuel. Part of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Then he makes a god and worships it, makes it a carved image and bows down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he roasts meat, eats it, and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I can feel the fire. The rest of it he makes into a god. His idol bows down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Save me, for you are my God. They do not know, nor do they comprehend, for their eyes are shut so that they cannot see, and their minds as well so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. Now shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded mind has led him astray, and he cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a fraud? This is the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. All right, what's going on here? Let's unpack this a little bit together, shall we? In general, this is a passage about idolatry, okay? Uh, It's a passage about these two craftsmen, okay? This is the image the text sets up. It is meant to be absurd. It's meant to be humorous, a ridiculous reading, okay? This carpenter cuts the tree, and he takes the wood, and half of it he uses to make firewood that he uses to to cook his lunch, okay? And then he takes the other half of the wood and carves an idol out of it and puts it up on the shelf to worship. This is crazy. This is absurd. He He is worshiping the same stuff that he used to cook his lunch, right? This is the image that Isaiah is setting up for us here. It's a great metaphor, isn't it? This person, this smith says, 
says, Watch over me, deliver me, for thou art my God. Ridiculous. Why? Because, again, you can't, you can't, as a human being, make a God with greater power than what you have. Right? You can't give yourself life. So, Isaiah says, it's like feeding on ashes. Great metaphor. Okay, the, the gritty cinders will irritate your lips and your, your mouth and, and dry out your mouth. Yes, and, and mm, interfere with your breathing and there will be no nourishment. doesn't matter how many of these ashes you eat. You can eat a whole big sack full of ashes and you will get no nourishment from that ash. There is no ultimate nourishment in an idol in something of this world, okay? And of course, for most of us, it's not, a, it's not a little wooden statue on the shelf that we're worshiping. Most of us aren't going out to our backyard smelters and extracting silver from its ore and, and making a little idol to put up on the shelf, right? No, we do something much more insidious than that. We call ourselves Christians. We start with the assumption that we're Christians, and then we make that whatever we want it to be right? Most of us are worshiping not the, the little wooden idol on the shelf, but the illusion of success, or the things that money can buy, right? Or the respect of others. These are the, these are the idols of the 21st century, no? And it's all feeding on ashes. Now, there's another layer to this, I think, as well, friends. Again, we're talking about the importance of of being willing to get into the fire a little bit, uh, to suffer a little bit, to allow you know, God to, to use that time to break down the pride, the ego in us, to renew us, and to make us whole in Christ. And, yes, we're called to, to be willing to get in the fire and suffer, and hmm, the ashes themselves, the suffering itself, can also become an idol, right? And that sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. We think we wouldn't do that, but let me name for you five, five ways, at least five ways that we do that, okay? And you tell me if, if any of these connect for you. Maybe you've done one of these things in your life. If not, you know somebody who has, okay? Five things, five, five reasons that people choose to feed on the ashes of suffering. First, Sometimes, in a strange way, our suffering can become comfortable for us, right? I know that sounds strange, but sometimes the suffering becomes comfortable. Maybe, maybe we, we would rather have the suffering that we know than the hard healing process that we don't, right? We prefer that which we know. It's awful, but it's the awful we know. It's familiar to us. And therefore, maybe it's less scary than change. Second, sometimes we are overcome by guilt and we think, I deserve to feel this way. I deserve to feel this way. I'll just leave that one right there. Third, sometimes... Mm, this is an interesting one. Sometimes our suffering is rooted in grief, okay? Grief of uh, a person that we've lost or a relationship that we've lost. The suffering is rooted in that, and we hold on to the grief. Why? If Danny and Amy were here, they are, they are pastors that, that come alongside people in grief, and, and I think they would tell us, sometimes we hold on to that grief because it's the last thing we have of that person. And we think if, if we let go of the grief, then we are forever letting go of this person or this relationship that we've lost, okay? Fourth, maybe the road to healing and recovery just seems too hard. I think we can all relate to that on some level, right? Fifth, sometimes we think, oh, hmm, sometimes we think if we want to be like Jesus, we really got to suffer. My dad told me this story years ago. 
He went in the 60s to minister in the Sahara Desert in Central Africa for two years. Okay, and he said, I felt like if I wanted to really be more like Jesus, I had to go suffer like Jesus. And so he went to Central Africa, Niger, for two years. And he said he was expecting this, this amazing, transformative, life-giving, healing, suffering. And he said what he got was suffering. He went from 185 pounds to 118 pounds. Suffering. We think maybe we want to be like Jesus, then we've got to suffer. And so, you remember the, the monks in, in uh, Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail? Maybe we're going to walk around whipping ourselves, right, to sort of manufacture this suffering in our lives. Pie le su domine, dona eis requiem. You remember those guys, right? But here's the thing. Manufactured suffering is feeding on ashes. It's feeding on ashes. It's just like making an idol. It has no real power to give us life. I was talking with Pastor Amy this week about what I was going to say, and she said, she said, yeah, if you, if you put your heart out there, don't worry, it's going to get stepped on. You're not going to have to recruit people to come step on it for you. Biblically speaking, yes, suffering is part of our story, but the suffering that grows us and transforms us is not a manufactured suffering. It's the natural suffering that comes as a product of doing the best we can to follow Jesus and minister to people in our community and live life one day at a time, right? And why? Why does, why does that kind of suffering grow and transform us? Precisely because that kind of suffering leads us to God. That kind of suffering, natural, it leads us to God, who is what? The only true source of spiritual nourishment. Amen? Yes, yeah, yes, suffering is part of our story. Yes, we're meant to get into the fire. And no, as we said in week one, suffering is not God's ultimate plan or, or desire or hope. For us, okay? Yes, God desires that, that we step into the fire, uh, that we allow God to, to break down that, that pride, that ego, to work on us in our sin and grow us in hope and in peace and in love. That love that, that transforms and transcends the brokenness of our lives and the brokenness of our community and our world. I read this this week from a scholar over 100 years ago. I thought this was just beautiful. And the language is, is a little, you know, more dated, but I thought it was just awesome. Let me share this with you. He wrote this, God is the only food for a person's soul. He says, you pick up the skeleton of a bird, and if you know anything about osteology, the science of bones... You will see in the very make of its breastbone and its wing bones the declaration that its destiny was to soar into the blue. You pick up the skeleton of a fish lying on a beach and you will see in its very form and characteristics that its destiny is to expatiate in the depths of the sea. I don't know what that means. I can only assume it means swim playfully and joyfully in the depths of the sea. And written on you, as distinctly as flight on the bird or swimming on the fish is this, that you are meant by your very make to soar up into the heights of the glory of God and to plunge deep into the abysses of God's infinite love and wisdom. You are made for God. I love that. The coin belongs, he says, to the king whose head and titles are displayed upon it. And on your heart, friend, though a usurper has tried to recoin the piece, 
and put his own foul image on the top of the original one, is stamped deep that you belong to the King of Kings. There was a young man that I worked with years ago. His name was Henry. Henry was a runner. He was a, a national champion runner as a teenager. And one day he was, he was running in a national race, and uh, he was in, you know, the top three, somewhere first, second, third place, running along, and suddenly his right leg, his femur, just broke. And, you know, he went, of course, to the hospital and, and uh, got a cast and all that, and they, they said it was just a fluke thing, you know, his leg just broke. So he worked the process, he was devastated, of course, missed a few races, but he worked the healing process, and a few months later, he was able to get back and, and start his training again. Worked his way all the way back, went through some races, got up to a national race again, running in the second mile of this national race, and his other femur broke. And at this point, Doc can probably guess what was going on here, they realized this wasn't a fluke situation, okay? He was diagnosed with osteogenesis imperfecta, which we know as brittle bone disease. Henry, as you might imagine, was devastated. Nationally ranked runner, uh, was hoping to get a college scholarship in running, had, had dreams, visions of competing in the Olympics, and it was over. The doctors told him that he would never run again. And so he went into a downward spiral and uh, told me later that he kind of just wanted to give up on life. But one day he was having a conversation, again, years later he's telling me about this, he was having a conversation with a pastor that he said was the most important conversation he'd ever had in his life. He said to this pastor, he said, Pastor, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know how to live my life because running isn't just what I did. Running is who I was. And the pastor said, no. Who you are is child of God. And he said that turned something in him. And he, he said he began, his words, to feast on the word. Well, God renewed his life day by day. And eventually he became a track coach. And he told me, he said, as I watched my students run, for the first time, I began to feel again the wind at my back. But it wasn't just that physical wind that I used to feel when I ran. It was a much deeper wind, the Ruach, the wind of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, I would like for you to, if you can, pretend that you have never heard the words that I am about to say. Pretend that this is the first hearing. This is my body. This is my blood. Drink me, all of you. It's utterly scandalous language. We have domesticated it over time, sanitized it, because we overhear it, or we hear it over and over again. But feast on the word. This is my body. This is my blood. During Jesus' time, in his Jewish tradition, to a group of Jewish followers, coming in contact with blood 
would typically mean becoming ritually impure. It would require a holy cleansing in order to be restored access to full participation, once again, in society. How daring, how shocking it would be for Jesus to turn the whole tradition, ancient tradition, of impure blood upside down by making it holy. What was considered unclean, untouchable, unacceptable is now at the center of the sacred. This is our story. Everything is in Christ. And Christ is in everything. There is only one love, and it is the love of God. From the ashes, God calls us forth and forms us in to new creations and breathes life into us and sets us forth to live fully and calls us good, very good. At this table, we are invited to take in love, be restored to life, and participate fully in the body. This is Jesus' invitation when he gathered with his friends, the disciples, took bread and blessed it, broke it open. Taking his life in his own hands, he gave it to them and said, this is my body, broken open for you. Eat this and remember me. In the same way, he took a cup. Giving thanks for it also, he poured it out. And giving it to them, he said, this is my blood. Drink of it, all of you. It is all that I am, all that I have poured out for you, poured into you, that you would have new life in me. Eat this bread, drink this cup. Remember me until God's love is fully realized and God's dream for all of humanity, all of creation, is realized. Let us pray. God of glory, God of love, in your presence we find peace and wholeness. You have come to us in Jesus Christ and prove your love for us at the cross. At the cross we have been justified, we have been reconciled, and we have been forgiven. Yet at this table, we remember not only that Jesus Christ suffered and died for us, but that Christ conquered death. We are not drawn here by the dead Jesus whom we remember, but by the living Christ whom we experience. Bless us as we eat this bread, for in doing so, we remember that your love took on human flesh. Bless us as we drank this cup, for in doing so, we remember that your love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. May this love transform our relationships, renew our congregation, and strengthen our witness to you in our daily world. Amen. All people are welcome at Christ's table. The invitation is new today to come alive and have new life in Christ. Diamonds 
time well, making diamonds out of dust. He is refining in his timing, making diamonds out of us. I'll surrender to the power of being crushed by love. Till the beauty that was hidden isn't covered up. Oh, it's not what I hope for. It's something better. He's making diamonds, diamonds, making diamonds out of dust. He is refining, and in his timing, he's making diamonds out. joy of the Lord it will be my strength when the pressure is on he's making diamonds oh the joy of the Lord it will be my strength when the pressure is on he's making diamonds oh the joy of the Lord it will be my strength when the pressure is on, he's making, he's making, he's making diamonds, diamonds, making diamonds out of dust. He is refining, and in his time, making diamonds out. He's making diamonds out of dust, making diamonds out of us. A few announcements before we receive our invitation. There's a lot of uh, great activities going on this week. Our ongoing Linton series and small groups on Wednesday evenings are at five o'clock. If you've missed a small group, don't worry. It's okay, you can still participate. Uh, you might call the office and let us know so we can figure out a group to put you in. Or if you were in a group and you missed a week, that's okay too. Uh, we would just love to have you. That's Wednesday evenings at five o'clock. We have food, we have um, people from the community in our various service organizations coming to talk about ways that we can serve. Who's coming this week, Justin? Uh, Forward Training Center is coming to speak with us. Forward Training Center. You know, the first year I lived here, I thought it was Fort Worth Training Center. Oh. That's what I heard. No, Forward Training Center will be here on Wednesday. Um, so if you can, come, eat, and plan to uh, participate and learn about how we can serve together. Then we have in the Narthex some sign-up sheets. One is for our upcoming golf tournament. It's going to be a lot of fun. You don't even have to be a really good golfer. Brian is better than you, but he's nice. He's nice about it. <laughs> it's true. Everybody's a better golfer than I am, so that's not hard. Yes. Uh, but sign up. Um, take a little risk and have some fun. Um, it's good weather. It's a good time to golf. Also, there's a sign-up sheet out there in the Narthex for our Seder meal on April 5th. That's on Holy Week. If you don't know what a Seder is, you're just going to have to come and find out. Um, you can also call the office or email me, and I will gladly explain it to you. But it is sort of the, the predecessor to um, our communion table, and it's part of our sacred story. So we just need to know how much food to purchase. If you can sign up out there, that'd be great. 
Okay, church. One more thing real quick, oh, Amy. Sure. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I just got a, a message from Austin. Apparently, Linda is sick this morning and couldn't come to serve in the nursery, so Megan is in there. But if anybody <laughs> is willing to step in there and hang out for a little bit and help Megan out today. You feel a tug on your heart to if help If you feel kids. a tug on your heart, just go sit with a little child. It's a good thing. We could really use some help. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Church, hear these words anew today as well. You are loved. And that changes everything. When Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? He's also asking Peter, who do you say that you are? Are you a lonely individual in this world trying to survive? Or are you part of something greater? And Peter says, you are the Christ the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And this is the beginning of our church. Jesus says, yes, this is the foundation of everything. On this, we can build holy community. And so our invitation today is to respond to this question again. We are loved. We are in Christ, and together we um, are invited to live more fully into that love in so many ways. Maybe it's sitting with kids in the nursery this morning. Not kidding, really and truly, that is holy community. Maybe it's staying and having coffee with someone you don't know, or going to a Sunday school class, signing up to go golf, and making a new friend. Little things can go a long way if we do them with great love. So let us consider how we might do that today. If you are new to us and you're at home, our website and our phone number are on the screen. We would love to have, be in conversation with you about how we might be in community with you. Or if you're in this room and you're looking for a place to fall more deeply in love with God, with love, with life, we would love to welcome you. As together, we stand and sing. What are we singing, Josh? Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah. That's appropriate. Please stand. Messiah, name 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear and believe the truth of Christ, that you are loved and that you are called to be love in the world until all people are restored to this love and know beyond all doubt that they belong to love. Go in peace and serve God. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom of heaven. Messiah, Lord of all. 